Welcome to episode 81 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent writing crime fiction inspired by true crime FBI cases. Today, we get to speak to retired agent Mark Ruskin, who served 27 years with the FBI. During his bureau career, he spent more than 20 of those years as an undercover agent. Mark successfully infiltrated a New York mafia crime family, a Chinese Malaysian heroin organization, a Wall Street trading exchange, right wing terrorist groups, and worked on espionage cases. In this episode, Mark Ruskin reviews his false flag espionage undercover role, posing as a French operative seeking to purchase uranium enrichment equipment that had been stolen from the United States Department of Energy facility in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. His undercover work in this case resulted in a former employee at the Oak Ridge complex being sentenced to six years in prison. Mark Ruskin was awarded five commendations from the director of the FBI for his work. A native French and Spanish speaker, he has worked at several U.S. embassies, including Paris, Madrid, and Buenos Aires. As a certified police instructor, Mark has lectured at universities and law enforcement academies. Since his retirement from the FBI in 2012, he has divided his time between a law practice in New York and extended stays in Yaoning Province, China, where he writes and studies Mandarin. Mark Ruskin recently published The Pretender, My Life Undercover for the FBI, a true crime narrative about his undercover roles and the FBI's undercover operations, the procedures, the successes, and the failures. It looks like I have another great case for you today. I am absolutely amazed at the retired agents and their cases and their storytelling skills, and Mark doesn't disappoint us either. Before we get to the interview, I do want to let you know that these are exciting times for me. FBI Retired Case File Review is quickly approaching 1 million downloads. I should hit the mark on or about September 15th, and when I do, I will celebrate the milestone by giving you a bonus episode that week. In my September email to my reader team, I share my thoughts about hosting and producing a weekly podcast. So if you're not a member of my reader team, you want to go to jerrywilliams.com and sign up when you see the pop up. My other news is that the audiobook of Pay to Play has been completed and is awaiting approval from Amazon slash Audible. I'm told it takes about a week to 10 days to hit the retail page. So I'll let you know during next week's episode or the following episode when it's available for sale. I also plan to send a special post to my reader team about the whole audiobook production process. It was a thrilling experience and a big investment to work with the professional voiceover actress who narrated my FBI crime thriller. At the end of next week's show, I'll include a short clip from the audiobook so that I can introduce you to my main character, Carrie Wheeler, a female FBI agent investigating corruption in the Philadelphia strip club industry. Pay to Play is the first book in my Philly Fraud series, and I'm currently working on the second book in the series now. I want to thank those who've already picked up a copy of the ebook or print book of Pay to Play. When you pick up a copy of Pay to Play for yourself or as a gift for someone who loves crime fiction, you're helping to support the podcast and to defray the cost for me to continue to produce ad-free content on a weekly basis. So thank you. Now here's the show. I'm excited to introduce my guest, Mark Ruskin. Hi, Mark. Hey, good morning, Jerry. I am really interested in learning more about this case because it's a little different. 
Um, but before we talk about this false flag case that you're going to tell us about, I first want you to tell me a little bit about your book, The Pretender. Yeah, well, first, uh, Jerry, thank you very much for inviting me to your podcast. The, the book, The Pretender, My Life Undercover for the FBI, just came out uh, in early June. And it basically uh, tries to accomplish two things. One, in, On the one hand, it's a memoir of my experiences in the FBI, primarily as an undercover agent. I was an agent altogether for about 27 years. And of those 27 years, about two decades, was as a uh, UC, as we refer to undercover agents. And then the other goal of the book is to try and give a little window to the general public into what the FBI is like behind the scenes, what FBI culture is like, what the relationship between agents and other FBI employees is, and a little bit about what management is like and how the management structure is different from the structure in other types of agencies. So it's a bit of an insider's peek into the FBI. And I think in, in that sense, it's a little bit unique in that no other uh, insider has ever really written about the FBI culture in quite that way. There have been some journalists like uh, Ronald Kessler who have written about FBI uh, operations and culture, but not from the inside. So, uh, so in that sense, it's a bit of a combination, and I think it provides a, a unique peek at the FBI and then FBI ops as well. Well, that's pretty cool because... This podcast is really the audio version of that. So why don't we talk about this false flag case and some of the other cases that you've done, and then we'll go back and talk a little bit more about uh, the book and you know how that's uh, how that's working out for you. Great. Of your years in the FBI, what was it about you that made you decide that you wanted to do undercover? Because that's a choice. It is a choice, uh, as you know, and, and uh, as the general public may not know, because I've often been asked by people outside the Bureau if there are special benefits to being an undercover or you know special perks. And the reality is that, if anything, uh, you, you kind of lose out by being an undercover in terms of having a career within the Bureau if you want to, for example, move up in management. Undercover agents... Uh, if anything, like, um, perce- perceived with a little bit of suspicion by the general agent population and certainly by management. So, and why is that? you got to explain that. The undercover agent spends a significant amount of his or her time interacting with the bad guys, you know, across enemy lines, you know, behind behind the uh, the front lines, between with divide the uh, the criminal and the, and the non-criminal world. And there's a feeling, a perception, sometimes uh, unarticulated among managers, that the undercover spending more time with the bad guys than with the good guys may be somehow tainted a little bit by the association, that maybe something will rub off on the UC and that uh, it'll have an effect uh, when the UC is back in the regular FBI uh, environment. So, uh, uh, and also another perception, and this is true among uh, regular agents, is that undercovers are off, you know, enjoying uh, fancy meals and driving fast cars and uh, benefiting from these kinds of uh, perks that uh, they, the regular agents uh, don't benefit from. And the truth of the matter is that, yes, you know, I did eat uh, at fancy restaurants sometimes, and I did drive a Mercedes 500 SEL and other high-end cars. But, you know, when you're you're having a fancy meal at a restaurant with people who are members of the Genovese crime family or or some other types of uh, notorious bad guys, it's not like you can relax and have a few glasses of wine and enjoy the meal as though you were with your friends. Your adrenaline is pumping. You're moving. Uh, your mind is going 100 miles per hour. And the last thing that you're focusing on is the food and uh, the luxury. You know, you're uh, totally fixated on uh, not blowing your cover and on 
getting the case moving in the right direction. So the perks are there, but they, they, you're not in a position to appreciate them. So Good and what, what attracted me to undercover work uh, in large part was the challenge. Was, was, in a sense, was to prove to myself that I could do it, that I had what it takes. Uh, it, it really is an enormous challenge to be able to cross over to the other side and be in a situation where you're pretty much without any immediate support and you have to think on your feet and you have to react and you have to uh, uh, gain the confidence of the people that you're dealing with to the point where they're willing to engage in behavior which is ultimately going to be contrary to their self-interest. Uh, so there's a lot on the plate when you're doing this kind of work. And uh, the sense of accomplishment, if you can do it successfully, is significant. You know, there may be fear leading up to a meet. There may be intense adrenaline drive during the meet. And then afterwards, there's the elation of having done a good job and having survived and succeeded. So uh, it's it's a very unique type of work. And, and I... To me, it was almost addictive. I mean, I did it for two decades, so there must have been a reason I stuck with it. And not many agents do. The the number of agents who are full-time undercover agents in the FBI is about 100. You know, there are other agents who do undercover work now and again and then go back to doing regular field work, uh, being field agents, which is essentially like a, a kind of a high-level detective. But of the agents who just do undercover work, one case after another after another, like I say, they're very few. And when you think that in a country of 300 million plus people, there are hundreds of us who are doing this kind of work, you realize that it's not a lot of people. And I take it that success in that line of business is obtaining as much information and evidence from the bad guys and witnesses as you can. Right. I mean, initially, it's developing intelligence. You know, there may be a crime problem, and no one knows how it's being done. You know, the the bad guys are are, are doing something, you know, whether it's importing uh, heroin from from Asia or fraudulently uh, making millions of dollars on Wall Street or whatever, but the Bureau may know it's happening, but may not know how it's happening. So the undercover first has to figure out the MO. What's the procedure? Get to know the bad guys and figure out how they're doing the bad things that they're doing. Then after we know what the MO is, then I have to gain their confidence so that they include me in their illegal operations. Then I have to gather the evidence we have to preserve the evidence. We have to do it in such a way that they don't get hinky or suspicious. And then you're right. At the end of the day, we have enough evidence to uh, go forward with uh, arrests and, and prosecution. So it, it's a multi-stage, multi-level type of operation that's evolving. And with the better case agents, they evolve and the undercover evolves and the scenario is tailored and changed as the case progresses to make it a successful one. You know, you'll see with the book in The Pretender that there were cases like that with very good case agents, such as uh, Sunblock, where I worked with uh, Mark Callan, who was like one of the best, and the case evolved and ultimately was extremely successful, and that case ended up with maybe 30 uh, international global uh, heroin importers in jail. And other cases were the case agents were rigid and were unable to uh, uh, alter the scenario and evolve it. And in those cases, uh, they essentially ended up uh, burning uh, uh, and failing. So uh, a lot of it's a team effort, and the whole team has to be flexible. Interesting. Now, was there an area of expertise? I mean, did you just do a certain type of case? Or what were the kind of investigations that you were brought in in your undercover role? Well, this is, I think, what makes my career a little different from most and what makes The Pretender a little bit more of an interesting read than most is that the majority of undercover agents specialize 
in one kind of case. So they will do, let's say, an agent uh, who was a who's a, a good friend of mine, uh, Jack Garcia, for example. He was superb at doing narcotics cases, and he did. That's what he did. He did. Uh, although he also did some mob cases as well, at which he was very good. But most agents will specialize in one area. Or there was another fellow I worked with, Mark Pecora, who was great at outlaw bike cases. He worked one after the other. And he was uh, very gifted at infiltrating outlaw motorcycle organizations, you know, clubs uh, of the pagans or Hells Angels type. What made me a little bit different is my background is such, I'm a native French speaker and a native Spanish speaker. I was born in France and I lived part of my life in Argentina. And I have kind of what uh, some friends have referred to as an all-purpose physiognomy. I'm a wiry guy. I can kind of pass for a different ethnic group types. So I worked all variety of cases. And what I specialized in was the technique of being a UC. Uh, I was basically an investigative tool. You know, a case agent has a number of investigative tools that they, he or she can use. You know, they can issue subpoenas, they can interview people, they can have wiretaps, uh, tap phones, and so forth. And using a UC is one more tool in their bag or basket of tools. And that was my specialty. I was the, uh, the high-end tool, so to speak. And I would be used by agents in different types of cases you know, to, to, to further the, uh, their, their investigations. But I worked white collar cases, I worked heroin cases, I worked stolen car cases, I worked counterintelligence cases. You know, basically, whatever I was asked uh, to do, uh, if I could do it, I, I would. I had trouble saying no. That, that kept me busy. <laughs> All right. I think what we need to do now is to talk about one of those cases and there's so many cases that you mention in the book, but I think the one that both of us agreed would be really interesting is this false flag case because it brings into light, you know, your, your French speaking abilities and your connections with France. So if you could, if you could start from the very beginning before you even become involved in the case and just kind of set it up for us, what happened at this nuclear cleanup site in Tennessee that brought the matter to the FBI's attention. Before explaining what started this particular case, let me uh, let me tell your your podcast uh, listeners a little bit about first what a false flag operation is. Just give a little perspective Perfect. before Perfect. focusing in on this particular case. You know, false flag operations are one of the most sensitive types of UC op that there is. And what it involves is the undercover pretending, assuming the role of an intelligence officer from another country, often a hostile country, but not necessarily a hostile country to the U.S. So the, the undercover is going to be interacting with a trader, someone within the U.S., who has access to classified information. Sometimes it's, in, or often I should say, someone in the military, government official, but it could also be an engineer or someone who works at the site that deals with classified information. And this trader is looking to sell classified information to a foreign power, uh, and generally for one reason, it is for money, out of greed and uh, is, has total disregard for the well-being of uh, his or her, her own country and is just more interested in, in gain. And, and sometimes there's some bitterness involved. You know, if they've been overlooked for promotion or they feel that they haven't been recognized by their superiors. So they will approach, they will make some kind of approach to uh, uh, a non-U.S. entity. And... Um, you know, I'll give you a, one example was uh, that I, another case, one of the several cases I worked, which were false flag operations, involved an engineer from a, uh, a nuclear plant who, who had access to nuclear type of information. And in this particular case, he was trying to uh, sell secrets 
to a uh, hostile Middle Eastern country. And uh, the, 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 the challenge that we had in that case was, you know, how to approach this fellow when we did not have any, there were no UCs who could uh, portray themselves as, as coming from this hostile Middle Eastern country. Uh, and I'm, I can't name that country because that that's classified. But the uh, espionage unit at uh, FBI headquarters with whom I'd worked on a few of these cases, and I kind of uh, knocked it around a bit, and the scenario we came up with was that I would approach him as a uh, intelligence officer from a South American or Central American country, uh, and, and speaking Spanish, I could do that plausibly. And he could think that I was maybe working for Cuba or Venezuela and explain to him that the country he was trying to deal with could not operate, operate, you know, could not have operational agents in the U.S. because it was too hostile an environment. So instead, they would contract with my intelligence service and we would do all their operational work in the U.S. And I actually Amen. flew, yeah, and I actually flew out with the team to the, city that he was based in and called him, uh, uh, basically a cold call, telling him uh, in Spanish that uh, you know, we had mutual friends uh, uh, from such and such country, and they had asked uh, me to meet with him, and I'm just uh, 45 minutes away, I'm at the courtyard Hilton, can you come over right now? And we knew where he was because he had this, there was a surveillance team on him at that time. And he, he swallowed the hook, came on over, and, uh, uh, we met several times. He even offered me, uh, and this is, uh, pretty amazing. He asked me if my, uh, uh, people would be interested in the, the plans and all the, uh, the blueprint on how to construct a dirty bomb. So he offered me for sale to the Middle East the plans to construct a dirty bomb to be used inside the United States. You know, now if that's not uh, someone who should be locked up with the key thrown away, then uh, I don't know what is. I know you were just teasing us with this one, but I am curious yes. as to why he wanted to give this information to that particular country. Well, I think that he probably thought that that would be the country that would be most likely to uh, want, uh, he, it was a country that he knew just from reading public sources was actively seeking to develop a nuclear capability. Okay. So, uh, and so he had de determined that they would be willing to pay big bucks for the uh, information that was between his ears in order to, uh, to develop their nuclear capability, which then could be used against our allies uh, in the Middle East and against ourselves. Uh, and this is a U.S. citizen, right? Go figure. What makes people like that tick? But the uh, so anyway, it, this just gives you a little uh, perspective on false false flag ops. The the key in his op and in the other one we're going to talk about right now is also you know, the first contact. We, being the bureau, will have some information that somebody is trying to sell information to a, a foreign power. And generally, there will be one opportunity, essentially, to make contact. And that's why this kind of case is usually really limited to people, uh, to UCs who have been working as an undercover for a while and have a fair amount of experience and are able to work under a fair amount of pressure. Because there's generally not a second bite at the apple. And when the mm -hmm. first contact is made, if the uh, target is not absolutely convinced that the UC is, in fact, a uh, intelligence officer, then they'll just hang up and walk away, and that'll be the end of the case. And these are usually cases where there is no proof, there is no evidence, uh, other than what's developed by the uh, undercover. So it has to be planned meticulously, and the first contact has to be completely convincing so that the, then the, the door is open and there can be a second and third uh, and so forth contact. Now, in the case that, that uh, we're concerned with today, it involved one Roy Lynn Oakley. 
And uh, Oakley was an employee of Bechtel Jacobs, which uh, works for the, it's, it's a contractor for the Department of Energy at their East Tennessee Technology Park, which is in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And he was not an engineer. He was basically a supervisor in facilities management. But he had access to uh, all kinds of materials and basically to the entire facility. And what he had done is he had reached out to a friend of his who was a contractor who did work overseas and told the contractor that he had some materials which were utilized in uh, the uh, conversion of uranium to make the uranium uh, radioactive, you know, to convert it uh, to gaseous diffusion, which is a term that I know how to say it, but I don't have no idea what it really means. <laughs> but uh, uh, but in, in any event, he had this, these materials and he had them for sale. And uh, the, the reason I can even talk about this is that the uh, uh, FBI and the Department of Justice has issued, subsequently issued press releases which described these items in the terms that I just used. So they are public, they are public record and they are, you know, it's information that was disclosed to the public by justice and by the Bureau. So I, so it, it, that's why I can discuss it uh, and why it's not classified. So he approached and he had told his friend, uh, knowing that the friend had contacts overseas, that uh, uh, if the friend could could provide him with an uh, introduction, that the friend would receive you know some kind of uh, piece of the action you know commission. What the friend did is he did contact some people, but the people he contacted wasn't what Oakley had in mind. He contacted the FBI, and the information found its way quickly to the espionage unit, a small unit buried at headquarters in the Hoover Building, which is just uh, established basically to handle this kind of case, where, where cases involving uh, Americans who want to sell uh, classified information. I had worked with them before, and they reached out to me. It was a, a Friday afternoon, uh, January 19, 2007, when I received a phone call. I, I was happened to be in the office. I wasn't there very often. But I got a call, and using an encrypted phone line, I was given a brief summary of uh, what was going on by uh, John Sarno, who was one of the senior analysts in the espionage unit. And uh, he explained to me that, as it happens, the Oakley was trying to sell this information to France, uh, of all countries. So what they were looking for, what the espionage people was look, were looking for, was an undercover agent who could pass for a French intelligence officer interested in making the buy. Having been born in France, and, and uh, again, French is actually my native tongue, my maternal language, I could pass easily. And then uh, you know, I would uh, just have to alter my accent a little bit, thicken it, in order to uh, establish my French uh, bona fides. I agreed to uh, to talk to them about it, and so that evening, uh, John and Michelle Levins, who's one of the supervisors in SSA in that unit, flew over to, flew into New York, and they also gave uh, a green light to Chris Day, who was the case agent in the Knoxville FBI division, and, and he was the one who was responsible for the case, and he flew in uh, the following Saturday morning. So Saturday we met uh, at my cubicle in the office, in, in the New York office down at uh, 26 Federal Plaza, and uh, over coffee had a quiet chat where they briefed me on uh, the situation with Oakley, and we discussed how we would uh, make the approach. And it's not something that we we discussed it, but then once we reached a uh, decision, it wasn't ours to just make the contact uh, on our own. This, because of the fact that this involved radioactive and uh, potentially uh, you know nuclear type information, 
there was a lot, a lot of attention at headquarters and at the Justice Department over this. I mean, they, I mean, it was, uh, you know, the, 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 one of the unknown factors was whether or not what Oakley was selling was in fact radioactive and whether it paused, uh, uh, it created for the general public some kind of, of risk. Uh, you know, you know, was this a, some, a situation where there was going to be a need to quarantine the area? You know, was there the, a possibility that if the materials were mishandled, that it could cause like a, a major, you know, health emergency in, in that region? You know, no one knew because no one knew exactly what it was that he had to sell. So the concerns were major. You can imagine that uh, the Justice Department, uh, the Department of Energy and the FBI were all very concerned that if this wasn't handled rapidly and successfully, that maybe there would be uh, some kind of outbreak of uh, some kind of radioactive matter. And so the, the, the lack of knowledge of what was going on was creating a lot of, uh, of angst and agita all over the place. The, now what Chris had, had Chris, uh, the case agent, had already done a lot of homework, and he had obtained Oakley's uh, home phone number, his cell phone number, and also the phone number for a track phone, you know, the kind of track phone being the kind of anonymous phone that uh, one can purchase. And a throwaway. Right, exactly. You know, once you buy at Walmart or Best Buy and don't register, you know, just buy minutes on a card. So, uh, so Oakley had a track phone number, and that's the phone number that he had given to his so-called friend, the one who had uh, alerted the Bureau. So the only number that we were supposed to have, that, uh, that myself and the name I was going to be using was Jean-Claude, that myself as Jean-Claude, the uh, intelligence officer, was supposed to have was the phone number for this track phone. So that afternoon, I place a call to the track phone, and uh, it's powered off. So I leave a voicemail, and uh, then we decide, and I leave a message saying, you know, call back. This is a you know, mutual friend from France. I use kind of a thick uh, Clouseau, you know, Inspector Clouseau accent. You know, I, go, I am a friend from France. We have mutual acquaintances, you know, to make it clear what this was about and asking him to call back the next day at 1 p.m. So now Sunday we're reassembled in the, uh, in the office by my cubicle. With and I'm making these calls from uh, my own track phone that Chris has given me, and we're waiting for a call. Time goes by, an hour or two after one, no call. I call back Oakley's track phone; it's still off. So now the question is, how do we establish contact with him? My thought uh, was, let's call him on his cell phone, his regular cell phone. Now the big concern was going to be. Hey, isn't that going to be hink him up? If he, we call him on the phone number we're not supposed to have, yeah. this is going to we set off to alarm it. bells. My uh, thought, number one, we have nothing to lose. Because if we don't try this, we don't have any contact with him. And we're not going to be able to, to get past point one. So this is like a toss of the dice, all or nothing. What I was going to prepare to tell him is if... He asks, hey, how, uh, how did you get this number? Well, we're an intelligence agency. That's our job is getting information, and, and we have the capability, the technology, and the know-how to find things out. And uh, you don't know what we're capable of. And so we got approval to go ahead with that. So I now I call him on his regular cell phone. I introduce myself uh, I am Jean-Marc. We have mutual friends. I know that uh, you would like us to meet. And he says to me, hey, I know who you are, or words to that effect, but we can't talk on this line. So call me back, and then uh, we arrange to speak on his track phone. And uh, a few minutes later, we're talking on, uh, on the track phone. And uh, now... He, he, he opens up and he's uh, uh, willing to uh, talk to me about what it is that he has to sell. And uh, 
even it starts using some of the terminology about uh, uh, gaseous diffusion and so forth. But then he tells me that uh, he can't talk too much about it, but uh, that it involves fuel rods. He so he sees actually uh, uh, getting a little bit more technical. And uh, we arrange to talk again the next day. I, I tell him I'm going to talk to my people uh, back uh, in my country, you know, making it very clear that it's a different country. So unless the, you know, I want to make sure this case is like airtight against him. And uh, we arrange to, to talk uh, the next day. And then you know, to show that I was a little concerned about how sophisticated he was, I asked him, I said, uh, uh, I also asked him what name he wanted to be used, uh, called by. You know, I, I'm pretending I don't know his name, obviously. So he tells me to call him Paul Collins. And so I say, Paul, uh, are you sure you're going to have enough minutes to talk to me when we speak uh, tomorrow? And uh, we found out later from the surveillance team, because he had 24-hour surveillance on him at this point, that as soon as he hung up with me, he jumped into his pickup truck, drove off to Walmart, and bought like a few more cards with additional minutes on it. So, so I, I planted the idea in his mind. The, the reason that the name he chose is somewhat interesting is that uh, the, apparently Paul Collins is the name of some right-wing blogger that uh, he must have been a fan of. So that gave us a little control, uh, concern about... Uh, what his mindset was. But, uh, a few more phone conversations and, uh, he, he explained to me that, uh, the sale price was going to be $200,000 for what he had to sell. Again, I told him I needed to talk to my supervisors and, uh, we had a few more conversations back and forth and he, uh, he, we agreed that, uh, in principle, that we would be making some kind of a deal. Uh, he told me that, you know, you're going to have to come down here and see these things yourself in order to uh, to establish, uh, you know, what, what their value. So, I again, I told him that $200,000 is a lot of money. I'm going to need to speak to my supervisors and that we have a six-hour time difference. Again, emphasizing the, uh, that I'm, you know, the, in Fran you know, France and the U.S., of course, have a six-hour time difference. I get back to him on the phone. I tell him that our engineers have examined the information and they think it's worth $120,000. And what I, I mention this because it's always been one of my principles as an undercover that you always haggle for price. You okay. always want to negotiate because if you all, if you too quick to accept a bad guy's offer, of a price, like whether they're selling you a stolen car, heroin, or or whatever, if you right away accept up front what they're what they're asking, that's going to set off alarm bells, you know. Because real in the real world, everybody everybody haggles. The okay. bad guys, yeah. right? So if if you if you say yeah, whatever you want, I'll pay it. Uh, the bad guy's going to think, wait a minute, what's, why is this guy so eager to make this deal? You know, he he doesn't like money, you know, so. So you always haggle, and in this case, I followed my uh, my UC principles of haggling, and we made the offer of 120. And this guy, <laughs> sharp uh, businessman that he was, said to me, he goes, "Hey, Jean-Marc, if it's worth uh, 120, it's to your government, it's worth 200. I'm not hag I'm not going to discuss price." So, <laughs> so that was the end of the uh, of the. Uh, Negotiation. Uh, negotiation. <laughs> now, uh, we agreed to speak again in a couple of days. And what we next did was uh, immediately made plans to fly back, uh, fly down to Knoxville. It's now Monday morning. So uh, we started uh, with the call to me on Friday, the meetings at the office Saturday and Sunday. And uh, Monday morning, we early, we fly down to Knoxville that morning. Uh, Chris, the case agent, was a former uh, military uh, special ops type guy, was a very, very excellent, very thorough type guy with a good sense of humor, but very serious. And when, I, when they told me what time we were going to be leaving Monday morning, I said, well, 
you know, I may still be in bed by that time. And he says, well, if you're not at the airport, I'm going to come and you know, drag you out of bed and make sure you're there. So uh, I made a point of being there on time. I'd only been <laughs> kidding, of course. But uh, he was a tough guy. In any event, we arrive at the uh, at the uh, RA, the resident agent, which it was a satellite office out of the Knoxville division. And uh, it was like arriving in a beehive. The, the, uh, the agency, resident agency, the office had tripled in personnel as a result of this case. They had flown in surveillance teams from all over the place. They had SWAT teams. They had set up a command post. And the special agent in charge of Knoxville, uh, Rick Lambert, was on site for the duration, uh, just to give you an idea of how much uh, importance was being given to this case. And, and Lambert, I have to say, was a true professional. He was, uh, he was the model, I think, for an FBI manager. He was cool, calm. While others around him were losing their control, he helped to bring everything back into perspective and uh, and exhibited some you know really uh, true leadership and Absolutely. he was very courteous with me i was it was very uh, a, a pleasure to meet him but i could tell that uh, things were were were, were really uh, up in the air there was a lot of brass from the fbi headquarters there there were people from the weapons of mass destruction unit and a bunch of other units all keeping track and and acting as liaison back to uh, the FBI headquarters and to the Justice Department. And they were still concerned, I take it, about the safety aspects of this. Right. They were concerned about the safety aspect in terms of safety to the, uh, to the general public because no one knew yet what, uh, what we were dealing with. I mean, we had, they had an idea, but they didn't know if the materials he was selling were, were unused or used, you know, whether they, they'd been exposed to radiation and whether they could contaminate uh, the environment, who knows? I mean, what if what he had was radioactive and was dropped into some water source uh, and they, they would contaminate drinking water, for example? Had they at least determined that he would have had at his facility the ability or the access to this type of dangerous level radioactive uh, material? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, his access was one of the things that uh, Chris and, and uh, the managers had, had determined right off the bat. And that's part of why the uh, energy level was ratcheted to uh, such a high level. He had access to all kinds of materials, and that, and that gave them cause for concern. The, uh, and so just to give you, an, uh, uh, give you and the, uh, the audience an, an idea, there were like a number of teams had been assembled to try and and accomplish you know the goal of safeguarding the uh, the population and reeling in Oakley and doing it in such a way that the case could be uh, built against them also with regard to the health issue the not least of my concerns was the risks not only to the general public but the risks to uh, your surely you know Mark Ruskin <laughs> You know, yeah. uh, you know, I, 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 I had never been. Yeah, you didn't sign yeah. up for that. Yeah, you know, I had bought in my years. At this point, I've been, I'd been doing undercover work. You know, it's it's 2007, uh, and I've been doing undercover work. My first long-term UC case was in 1990, so I, I already, you know, was a, had been doing it for a while, and. The last thing I wanted was to be buying, you know, I, I bought heroin, I buy stolen cars, I bought all kinds of things, but I had never bought anything that could, you know, personally give me, uh, leukemia or cancer or, or God for, you know, God forbid. So I, I had major concerns for my own well-being and that was an issue that was going to have to be addressed as well. A after arriving and after some more planning, I made some more calls to Oakley and th the date for the buy, for the purchase, was set for that Friday. So it was now Monday and we was going to be, uh, Friday afternoon, or Friday morning rather. And initially the, you know, the, the powers that be wanted it to be, it to be done as, you know, quicker. But there was just so much planning and so many steps, uh, that had to be done, taken care of that there was, it was virtually impossible to get it done any earlier. I mean, to give you an idea, there were, uh, 
there were a bunch of teams. There was a SWAT team uh, or a number of SWAT teams that had been put together uh, with you know one overall commander, and their job was to plan all the operational details, you know, how the teams were going to be deployed, you know, who was going to be responsible for the arrest, who was going to be responsible for for other types of hazardous situations which could evolve. There was a team of engineers that had been assembled from Quantico and from the Department of Energy, and their job was handling risk containment, you know, hazmat, uh, procurement of specialized radiation related equipment. Uh, there were technical teams that had been put in place to, with, to determine what would be the best way to assemble, to uh, record uh, any kind of conversations and video using state-of-the-art equipment. There was a command post, as I mentioned, at the uh, resident agency coordinating everything. And then there was the UC team. There was the undercover team you know, consisting of me, and Chris, Chris was acting as the liaison between myself and the RA, keeping me aware of what was going on and what was being developed. And then John Sarno from the espionage unit, who was running interference between me and Hoover building uh, people who were trying to pepper me with questions and requests and advice on uh, how to handle the, the ultimate buy. So everybody had, had, their, had their role. One of the uh, things that was uh, prepared for myself was a, a new, one of the engineers at the Department of Energy gave me a uh, what I refer to as a uranium enrichment 101 course or, or <laughs> centrifuge for dummies because I really didn't know too much, you know. But uh, it's like I knew nothing, but uh, you know I had to know at least a little bit to be able to talk to Oakley when I finally met with him. One of the questions we had was. Uh, you know, why would a foreign power be willing to pay $200,000 for, for, for these materials? And what the engineers explained to us was that for a country to do the research and develop this on their own, assuming they had the, uh, the high level of, you know, technological capabilities, would cost literally hundreds of millions of dollars to develop this on their own. So if they could buy it for $200,000 and then reverse engineer it and manufacture it from themselves, uh, they would be saving literally million, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. So 200000 was really not a big investment. It was, not a, it was actually a bargain for whoever was to purchase this. The, but he, uh, thinks he's con- he thinks he's contacting someone representing the French government. And you right. would think that you that the French are at our level when it comes to developing this type of material. I could see a third world country not having the ability, but France, you know. What well, you know, the way he knew about this is that in the security briefing, you know, as you know, as a, a retired agent. Uh, when we uh, FBI agents receive our security clearances, our, our, our clearance to uh, access and have uh, review uh, classified, you know, secret or top secret materials, we're given a briefing. And when he had been given his briefing, uh, he and his colleagues had been told that among the countries that do not have this technology is France. So he, so I mean, France, I guess, has other ways of uh, enriching uranium, but not uh, not through these types of of, of materials. So he knew that uh, the French were a uh, potential market, and uh, he had said to his friend who made the original introduction that he didn't want to sell it to the North Koreans or to any Arab states. Uh, being kind of a, a, a right-wing type of fanatic. So he wanted to sell it to a more palatable country. So he didn't mind being a traitor if it, was, if it meant giving it to the French. Okay. <laughs> the, uh, Rational, so, rationalization. Right, yeah, exactly. So, uh, so Monday night uh, I call him and uh, at and i tell them we want to have pictures you know my supervisors are willing to we're going to they're going to pay the 200,000 but first they want pictures uh, of the 
of whatever it is he has to sell. So he f- says no problem. And, and thinking that the, he's very unsophisticated, I, I suggest to him that he go buy. This is before you know the, uh, when they still had disposable cameras. You know, so I say, why don't you go buy a disposable camera and take pictures? And he says, no, I, I've got. I, I can take digital pictures and send, give you the guys a floppy. So I said, well, okay, serves me right. He's a little more sophisticated than I had this, I had thought. So I tell him, I, I, I tell him, very good. Put the uh, floppy in a uh, FedEx envelope and drop it off at the uh, airport Hilton, and I will make arrangements to have it transferred to myself uh, back in uh, New York. And I, I'm not in New York, of course. I'm right there in Tennessee, but he doesn't know that. And he agrees to do that. So next day is Tuesday. Tuesday afternoon, the tech agents are setting up in the lobby of the hotel. They've got a ladder there. They're installing video cameras. And they're, they're arranging for, with the concierge to have an FBI agent wearing a concierge uniform the next day to uh, to greet Oakley when he comes in with the envelope, with the floppy, so everything can be documented correctly. So there's five tech agents working in the lobby on Tuesday afternoon when who walks in through the door but Oakley a day early with his uh, envelope and the floppy. At the tech agents see him walk in, and the one on the ladder, I think, almost fell off the ladder when he saw that. So they were wiring up the lobby, preparing for the next day. Correct. And he shows up a day early. With the, I guess he's so eager to make the deal, he doesn't want to, to, to take any chance that it's going to go south. So he uh, shows up a day early, and the case right then and there is almost blown out the window, except for the fact that the, uh, you know, the tech agents, of course, are dressed in civilian, you know, working type clothing, and. Uh, he uh, must have just assumed that they would make in some repairs uh, to the lamps or in the ceiling overhead. So he walks straight to the front desk, drops off the envelope, talks to the uh, concierge a little bit, explains, and then walks out. And then disaster averted, but just barely. You know, the you know, in, of course, you know, hindsight tells us that they should have done the installation at 3 in the morning, you know, not in the middle of the afternoon. But, uh, again, that's that's twenty twenty hindsight. And at this point, the concierge is an actual hotel employee and not another agent playing the role. Correct, correct. correct. So it, it wasn't as good as what could have uh, happened, but at least... Uh, uh, the concierge was on, uh, on the ball enough to uh, to not ask too many questions or, or make an issue as to why this guy's dropping off this uh, FedEx envelope with no address on it, just a name. The, once the pictures are examined, now we, every, the engineers have a better idea of what's going on. They still can't tell from the pictures if the materials are radioactive or not, but they know that it's the real thing. It's the real deal. And we agree to, to make the buy. So my concern is not to be exposed to any radioactive materials. One of the uh, hazmat, in fact, the chief of the hazmat unit did a demo for me at the uh, RA. And what they did is they had a Geiger counter, which I was going to be carrying in the meat. The Geiger counter kind of looks like a, essentially like a blow dryer, you know, like the kind you use to, uh, to dry your hair after a shampoo except that the end is closed off. But otherwise, it looks exactly the same, and it's battery-powered. And what they did is on the table, they had three coins enclosed, encased in plastic. So they put the Geiger counter next to uh, one coin and silence. Then they put the Geiger counter next to the middle coin, and it goes click, 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 like that. And they explained to me that's... Like the level of radiation from maybe a watch, you know, that the, the, the numerals on your watch that glow in the dark. And then they put the Geiger counter next to the third coin, and it's click, 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 and they said, that's gamma rays. So they said, you're going to be carrying this Geiger counter, you know, go over the guy with the, and the materials of the Geiger counter, and if it, you hear the gamma rays, then you know it's radioactive. Well, that wasn't very reassuring. 
but uh, at least I knew I'd have a tool to to see if I had uh, any risk exposure. Then they also were going to give me two key fobs, which were passive radiation detectors. So these I'd be wearing, I'd be having my pockets, and then afterwards they would be examined uh, in a lab to determine if there'd been any radiation exposure. Again, that's not too reassuring. It's telling me later on, okay, you know, you were exposed uh, two days ago to radiation. The uh, other thing that they, which was actually the most significant the thing that they had planned, is they were going to have a uh, truck, like a panel truck, between me and him. And I'll explain the uh, the setup for the meet. The meet ultimately was going to take place on the roof of a four level garage by the airport Hilton. It was a standalone garage and the roof was exposed so that uh, it would be could be filmed from the hotel. And uh, I would meet with the, with Oakley on the roof on the, one of the lower floors the they were going to set up a panel truck with very sophisticated gamma ray detectors. So when Oakley drove by the truck the uh, detectors would determine at that point if there was any gamma radiation coming from his vehicle or himself. And inside the truck was a SWAT team with wearing hazmat uh, uniforms, costumes. So if he, or when he drove by the that choke point, were there to be any radiation, uh, they would at that point immediately uh, block him off jump out of the panel truck and take him down. Uh, and that was uh, the, uh, the the biggest uh, reassurance to me that uh, I wouldn't be uh, exposed to the radiation. That's pretty sophisticated planning there. Yeah, no, they, they I mean, they, 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 and that was, you know, for my well-being. So they, they were taking it very seriously. You know, I'll move up now uh, to the actual meet. The night before, I was told uh, John and I, we'd been staying like at an embassy suite uh, in Oak Ridge. We were told to relocate to the airport Hilton so we would be in place. Uh, and they were, uh, you know, management wanted me there secured the night before. They weren't going to take any chances that I got stuck in traffic or had a car accident Friday morning on the way to the meet. So we, we, we arrive at the, at the hotel and we were told that uh, the bureau already had two rooms on the top floor, you know, facing the garage where the meet was going to take place. So we didn't need to rent rooms. So John Sarno and myself go to the rooms, and it's basically one room was going to be the command post, and the other room was going to be the tech technical agent's command post. And both rooms are littered with equipment. There are tripods with with telescopes and and cameras with uh with uh long distance lenses recording equipment you know these uh, box you know these uh, big boxes that are that uh hold the SWAT type equipment the pelican cases and uh, guys trooping around and uh I looked at these two rooms and I said to myself I don't think so. I went through, I went down to the lobby and I said, I'd like a, a, a I'd like a room, a nice, uh, king size bed, quiet room for myself, please. Said, oh, well, you have to, you can't book a room here. Said, what do you mean you can't book a room? It's just the front desk. Oh, you have to go through our 800 number. So, and I wasn't going to get into, <laughs> you know, I was I, I figured, I've been staying in hotels all my whole life. I thought you'd just go to the front desk and ask for a room, but, at that point, I wasn't in the mood for an argument, so I called the 800 number, and 10 minutes later, I've got a nice room, uh, have a nice dinner, and go to sleep. The next morning at 7, John, Sarno, and Chris show up, and John had slept in one of the uh, two uh, command post rooms, and he's all frazzled and blurry-eyed. And I said, what happened? So that, well, when I'm starting at 4 in the morning, that's when the guys in the SWAT uniform starts trooping in and out and the walkie-talkies blaring and the coffee runs. And I realized that getting my own room probably was one of the best operational decisions I'd made since uh, we arrived. The, uh, that would not have been a very quiet night. 
be that as it may, the uh, we got set up. You know, I uh, we had bought clothing clothing for me to wear. I wasn't going to wear my own clothing to this because then I'd never use it again. So we had actually Chris and I had bought had gone to a uh, didn't have any French clothing stores, but uh, J C Penney had to do. So we bought a whole uh, everything from the underwear to uh, uh, cap. A short brimmed, you know, European style cap we found. And the idea being that after the meet, uh, everything was going to be put in a bag and burnt, incinerated. The, so uh, the, uh, I got dressed up in my new clothing, put on the radiation detectors. Uh, I had my portfolio that I used to always use. It was a, uh, a black portfolio with a, a Kevlar bulletproof panel in it and a pouch for a uh, my uh, pistol that I would you know I would carry with me and uh, and then another kind of a gym bag which had uh, two hundred thousand uh, dollars you know two plastic bags with a hundred thousand dollars each and Chris asked me he said Mark please whatever you do try not to have this guy open these bags because if he does then we have to count all the money before we give it back and uh, that's going to take a while. So I told him I would do, I would do my best. Were they sealed had, uh, in some way so that you could detect whether yes. they had been open or not? Yes, they were sealed by, the, and that's how the bank gave it to Chris. So as long as Chris gave it back to the bank in the same state, then uh, they would, the money wouldn't have to be counted. Okay. And what, what he had done too the night before is he had parked a, my supposed car on the top floor of the garage and then uh, uh, another space had been reserved by by parking a, a, a bureau car for Oakley to pull into and that had been part of the planning with the uh, the SWAT team guys had originally planned to put Oakley's car next to mine and I said my suggestion was not to do that because if he if his car was right next to mine we could be in each other's cars talking and they wouldn't see what was going on. And with the light reflecting on the windshield, it really would be a problem. So what they came up with, which was a good idea, there was a, a, a stairway, enclosed stairway, and then there was an area in front of the stairway with yellow lines blocking out a lane. And then another parking spot opposite that. So between Oakley's spot and my spot would be the lane with that was yellowed out, so that would allow an area in, of maybe in whatever 15 feet that we would have to cross and be and talk. Uh, we both have to get out of our cars and be talking, and thus could be observed by uh, all the video uh, people on the, in the hotel room at the Hilton. Plus, there was a pickup truck set up right next uh, across the roadway from my car. They had a hidden video camera that would also be filming the meet. So I, I got there. So, you know, after everything got turned on, about 15 minutes later, I walk over to the garage, walk up the steps, and uh, approach my car, pop open the trunk, put in the cash and uh, an attache case, which I opened. Actually, there was an attache case there already uh, planted by Chris. I opened it, and that's where... Oakley was going to be putting the uh, his materials. Then the other thing that was happening next is that the inside the stairwell, a SWAT team assembled, and their job was to take the case down once the meet was over, or take take the Oakley down. And if there was an emergency, then he would they would intervene before the case was over. So I arrived there, uh, waited for Oakley, and. Uh, at about nine o'clock, he shows up. He pulls up in a Lincoln Town car, parks in the empty spot that we had reserved for him, and uh, and then we started to talk. He was all business, and uh, and willing though to explain to me, uh, you know, uh, how he had gotten the materials, and he actually told me how he had smuggled them out, and uh, and all the procedures that were in place. Uh, to, to prevent materials like that from being removed from uh, from the facility, uh, although he and he he commented make, uh, making fun of the of his own employers that that most of the buildings had metal detectors, 
but that the one where he had removed these materials did not. Uh, so he was uh, uh, laughing at how careless they were. And the other thing, apparently, the materials that he was selling me, it was a, a little baggie with these uh, these tubes in it. The uh, he said that there were tons of the of these uh, of this stuff back at the at the facility. Uh, literally, there was now, uh, and then the facility was being closed. You know, so we talk about how the Russians aren't able to keep track of their old uh, nuclear stuff, but. You know the impression that he gave was that uh, that we don't do a much better better job. You know the uh, you know I, I cleared him with my Geiger counter. The uh, no reaction, no clicking at all. So after that, I felt a lot more I felt a lot more relaxed. And uh, I can understand you know, that. <laughs> and once he saw the money, he he uh, himself. Uh, calm down. Uh, you know, any stress that he had had once uh, he saw the two bags containing the two hundred thousand, and once they were in his car, uh, the uh, uh, atmosphere changed significantly. Uh, the uh, we, we talked a little bit about the. Uh, I asked him about smuggling the. Uh, if I could get, if I need to worry about a metal detector, and uh, uh, he. So there wouldn't be a problem. One thing I noticed was that he he had his hand in his right uh, pocket of his windbreaker doing much of the meat. But I didn't make you know for me at that point the adrenaline was pumping, and uh, and I didn't uh, make too much of it. Once the uh, once I I pretty much as much information as I could possibly get out of him, I gave the signal. Which was uh, thank you for uh, helping my country, and as soon as I said that, the uh, SWAT team came pouring out of the uh, of the stairway, and uh, then there was a, a big uh, uh, lot of commotion, and uh, you know the the instruction the instruction I had given to the uh, team about myself was they were going to cuff me as well to make it look like, so he wouldn't know that I was uh, an undercover. He would think, I'd, you know, we were both being arrested. But I told the team, make a lot of noise, yell at me, but don't cuff me until he's secured. You know, whenever I did a, whenever I was being arrested in my undercover career, I always would tell the arresting agents not to cuff me until the bad guys were all cuffed. Right. Because I didn't, you know, I was always concerned if things go bad, uh, and there's uh, any shooting starts, I don't want to be running around like a chicken with my hands cuffed behind my back uh, trying to duck for cover. Now, you want to be able so, to defend yourself. Exactly. So uh, I can't wait to hear what his reaction was when he when the SWAT team pours out. You know, I didn't, couldn't see it because I was you know, being thrown on the front of an SUV myself, and they were yelling at me, you know, shut, shut up and some profanities. And I was shouting, I am a tourist, I am a tourist, what are you doing? I am a visitor, I want to call my consulate. And they, threw, and they cuffed me and threw me into the SUV once he was secured. And, uh, and then they uncuffed me once I was in the SUV. And uh, another SWAT team guy pokes his head in and says, okay, you know, we're, we're moving him out. And then uh, he says, oh, by the way, uh, in, we found a 380 in his uh, right uh, pocket of his windbreaker. So uh, so the reason he had his hand in his pocket was that he had his pistol there. Uh, so during most of the meet, I had a pistol pointed at my abdomen and uh, wasn't even aware of it. Some things you can't control. But that, that was, you know, at the end of the day, you know, you know, part of the pressure, too, was that when, you know, this meet was being videotaped and the video was being fed not only to, to Knoxville, but to FBI headquarters, to the Justice Department. So there were a lot of eyes looking at what I was doing. And, uh, and that really did put a, a lot of pressure on me that, uh, you know, I really didn't want to blow it. You know, it's bottom line. You know, I had to be very careful about that. So at the end, what was Roy Oakley charged with? Well, his attorneys negotiated with the uh, prosecutors, and they were able to finally bring it down to a plea 
where he pled guilty to uh, attempting to sell restricted uranium enrichment equipment. So he uh, just pled guilty to this one charge and was sentenced to uh, seven years in prison as a result of that. Uh, wow. He could have faced the potential of, of 10 years just on that charge and had the lawyer not done a good job in negotiating, if they had charged him with everything that they potentially could have, I think he would have faced, you know, 25 years or longer in prison and, and would have, would have uh, died in prison uh, had that, had he received such a long sentence. How old was he? By the time, at the time he was sentenced, he was 67. I do have just some really quick follow-up questions. I know we've gone kind of long, but I'm still fascinated about your French background and having been uh, born in France. To be an agent, you have to be an American citizen. So I, I, <laughs> I take it that your being born in France what was were your uh, parents overseas during the time that you were born, or how, how did that work out? I was born in France. My mother is, a, or was, at least at the time, was a citizen of France and Argentina. She was a dual national. And I was born in France. My father was an American medical student studying medicine in Paris. So they had met in Paris, gotten married. I was born and my brother was born. And so we, both of us were dual nationals. And then relocated to the United States where I I went to a French elementary school, and at home we spoke French because my mother didn't speak English at the time. So I didn't learn English, actually, for a long time. And uh, as far as the Bureau was concerned, you know, when, they a- when I applied to become an FBI agent, they asked you, are you a citizen of the, of the United States? And uh, I put yes. Uh, I didn't volunteer. You know, if they weren't going to ask me any other questions, I wasn't going to volunteer it. So the, there was no box about, do you have dual citizenship? No, I, there may have been a box as to whether you have more than one passport. But uh, at that time, I didn't have more than one passport. I had a U.S. passport, and that was it. Now, fast forward to uh, you know more than 15 years later, I'm stationed in Argentina. I worked for a few years as an FBI liaison officer stationed at the Buenos Aires uh, U.S. Embassy working in Argentina, Uruguay, and Paraguay. And that's an interesting story in and of itself. And there's a chapter in The Pretender dedicated to my time in Argentina and and South America. But now I'm approaching 50, and I'm beginning to think of retirement jobs. And I obtained a French passport from the at the French consulate in Buenos Aires. Uh, I applied for it. And I, don't, I, don't know, I don't think I've ever had one before, but I'm thinking if I retire and I want to work for a company that does business in Europe, it may be beneficial to have a, uh, a passport, the European passport. Then an American company could hire me and not use up one of their limited spaces and you know place me somewhere in Europe. So uh, move back, get transferred back to the U.S., and the FBI – has me fill out a form for my routine reinvestigation. And the form asks, do you have, again, they ask, are you a U.S. citizen? Yes. Do you have more than one passport? Yes. Now the uh, alarm bells went off, and uh, the security division started doing backflips when they found out I was (laughs) a dual national. The first reaction was, you know, they interviewed me, uh, the security interview, and they asked me, uh, to re- renounce my French citizenship. And I said, no. Uh, you know, had I been a rookie, they probably could have gotten away with it. But, uh, being at this point eligible to retire, I wasn't gonna give up French citizenship for the privilege of staying a couple of extra years in the Bureau. They kind of scratched their heads and then they came back to me and they said, Mark, if you're willing to sign a, uh, a security I mean, a loyalty oath, uh, and su- surrender your passport until you retire, then we'll just let things be. And I said, fine. So I signed the loyalty oath, and I gave them the passport, and uh, and that was uh, and they, that made them happy. They could show they did something. When I retired, finally, at, uh, in 2012, I got my passport back. 
when they found out I was French, they weren't very happy. I think they were glad to not have to worry about me anymore at that point. Well, that little side story just gives an example of all of the different things that you probably cover in your book. So I want to tell everybody again, your book is called The Pretender, My Life Undercover for the FBI. It's been out for uh, just a month or so. It looks like it's doing well. And uh, I definitely recommend that the listeners who want to hear more about your career in the FBI and all those behind-the-scenes stories go out and, and pick up a copy of The Pretender. And I thank you very much, Jerry, for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to to tell a few stories uh, from uh, my uh, my UC career. Thank you. Uh, much appreciated. Yeah, I'll give you the last word. Is there anything that you want to say that sums up your thoughts about the FBI or your career? Winston Churchill said that uh, democracy is the worst form of government except for all others. And you could almost say the same thing about the Bureau. The Bureau has got its problems, except it's still the best law enforcement agency way beyond all others. The, the men and women who are the FBI agents and the other professionals of the Bureau are probably like the best people I've had the privilege of knowing and working with. And if I had to do it all over, over again, I, I certainly would. I don't regret a minute, and I'm sure you feel the same way. And that's the end of the interview. As always, back at jerrywilliams.com, you'll find a photo of Mark Ruskin. You'll find newspaper articles about the case. And you'll find a direct link to his book. If you enjoyed the interview, I hope you share it with your friends, family, and associates. I make it easy for you at the bottom of the episode show notes. You'll find all the social media share buttons. And of course, if you're listening on your phone, you can share it directly from your device. All right, I have a crime fiction recommendation for you. And it's going to sound like a repeat because for the third book in a row, It's all about James Patterson. I admit it last week or the week before that I had never read a James Patterson book. And now I've read three in a row. So the James Patterson book I read this week was Second Chance. It's another one of his women's murder club mysteries. And Second Chance brings together those four friends, the homicide detective, the reporter, the assistant district attorney, and the medical examiner who use their professional skills to solve murders. This time, Lindsay Boxer has been promoted. She's now a lieutenant, and she is looking at a group of murders that she believes are racially motivated. A symbol left behind at the murder scene leads to a racist hate group. The murders tie back to the police department because all of the victims were either related to police officers or were police officers. I really enjoyed it. I'm glad that I gave him a read. While you're at Amazon checking out James Patterson's books, I hope you'll also check out my FBI crime thriller, Pay to Play. This episode was sponsored by FBIRetired.com, the only online directory made available to the general public featuring retired FBI agents and analysts interested in showcasing their skills to secure business opportunities. I want to thank you for listening, and I hope you come back again for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.